As a little kid, I'd run across this rickety bridge to head to school. This was in Kashmir, which is high in the Himalayan mountain range at the northern tip of India. There was no television in my life, no phone. Cutting edge technology at the time was a good shortwave radio. Computers existed in our imagination. But we did have semi-autonomous vehicles like this one that I often took to school. Now, we pull out an iPhone and call an Uber. It's incredible, just in a few short decades. But what's even more incredible is the change, the technological change that we'll see in the next decade or two as artificial intelligence, or AI for short, becomes more ubiquitous in our lives, powered by more and more data that we generate with each passing day. In a few years, that Uber will be driven by another machine, and yet another machine will talk to all the vehicles on the road in real time, ensuring that humans aren't messing things up, as we are so prone to do. The rise of AI has created all kinds of scary talk about machines replacing us because they can do most things better than we can, and there won't be much left for humans to do. There's talk about futures where machines could turn into our overlords, dystopian futures where we lose our freedom, where machines are misused, and we lose our freedom and our, our right to be left alone. Once machines become part of the fabric of our lives, we become dependent on them, both individually and as a society. So, should we worry about things going wrong? What are the risks associated with automation? The truth is that machines can and will make mistakes. This is especially true of machines that learn from data. You've probably experienced this in your lives. I'm sure you've had some less than satisfactory experiences with that autocorrect or autocomplete on your phone, like this one, where it autocorrects to something you didn't quite intend. You know, what's the machine thinking? The second problem with such AI systems is that we're never entirely sure about what they've learned and what they haven't learned. What does that autocorrect on your phone really know? It isn't clear. Sometimes it can't seem to get my intentions right, even after I've repeatedly rejected its suggestions, while at other times it surprises me by completing a rare proper noun. Even though such systems do well on average, we tend to lose transparency. There's no easy way to expose the basis for their decisions. They can't introspect. So this is the AI conundrum in a nutshell. When should we trust machines that can make mistakes and can't directly explain their behavior? I converged on this question as a key issue for AI systems based on over 20 years of research that started with a simple question in the mid-90s. Could I design a machine that could learn to make good investment decisions on its own based on ongoing data? From the start, it seemed clear that the machine would need to be adaptive to be able to learn new things as it went along. Machine learning seemed like the natural approach, and I was fortunate that several institutions trusted me with their money on this new way of systematic investing. For the first 10 years or so, I kept the machine on a tight leash. My colleagues and I would sometimes override its decisions, like if they seemed counterintuitive or just downright dumb, or if we just thought we knew better. We learned a lot during this time, most importantly, that we typically did worse than the machine. Clint Eastwood summarized this well. Man's got to know his limitations. We eventually turned the machine on autopilot in 2009 after a lot of analysis around the trade-offs involved in giving more control to the machine. By this time, we'd observed it long enough to understand its behavior and to build in the adaptive capability. This experience led me to realize that trust boils down to two independent elements. I've combined these two elements into a useful tool that I'm going to share with you now. So here's how to think about trust. 
The field of data science provides ways to estimate the inherent predictability of problems, and this predictability varies from zero to one. Think of zero as meaning it's impossible to do better than random, whereas one means your predictions are perfect, you're never wrong. For example, if I ask you to predict who's going to win the Super Bowl next year, chances are you'll be wrong. Like, who knows? So many things can happen between now and then. But if I ask you to predict whether the president will tweet tomorrow, well, that's pretty much a sure thing. <laughs> now, as a practical example, an autonomous vehicle such as a self-driving car would fall on the higher end of the predictability spectrum because the physics associated with navigation is well understood and the evidence to date is encouraging, suggesting few driving errors. In contrast, online targeting is a very difficult prediction problem. It's very difficult to show someone an ad at exactly that right time that induces them to act. Investing is similarly difficult since all kinds of unforeseen events occur all the time. Whereas lending might fall somewhere in the middle. So this predictability axis is a good proxy for how often a system will be wrong. In fact, it might seem reasonable to think that we should trust machines with the more predictable problems and not with the less predictable ones. But that thinking ignores a critical factor, namely, how bad are things when the machine is wrong? This is the cost per error, which measures the consequences of being wrong. Think of this in monetary units that vary from zero to very large. Usually, we care about the worst case situation. Consider the public reaction if a driverless car plows into a bunch of kids by mistake. Right? That's a really high worst case cost of error. In contrast, in an investment portfolio, the risks could en be engineered to be quite low. Similarly, with online targeting, it's no big deal if most of the ads are ignored because they're relatively cheap. But lending mistakes can be relatively costly, resulting from loan defaults. So here's what the model of trust looks like in terms of these two dimensions. And it's a simple heat map. In the darker green areas, we should trust the machine. In the dark red areas, we should not. Think about it. If a machine never makes mistakes, we should trust it. But even if it does make some mistakes and they're not costly, that's still OK. But at some critical level of cost, we begin to lose trust. These critical cost levels along the predictability axis make up the automation frontier. The automation frontier is the pale green zone between the red and green triangles. It explains why we might trust a machine with making investment decisions, but not with driving us around, despite the fact that market predictions are often wrong, whereas driverless cars hardly make any mistakes. That worst case situation haunts us. So a few months ago, I drove a friend's Tesla in auto driving mode in downtown Manhattan. So here I was, a data scientist who's been touting the benefits of autonomous learning systems. I've argued that machines are better than humans at many tasks. And yet here I was, this was my moment of truth. Was I willing to put my life where my mouth is? It was hard. It was really hard. But I did eventually let go when I realized that it drove better than most cab drivers in New York City. <laughs> but I'm not willing to completely let go just yet. The automation frontier also shows us where the opportunities lie. Imagine all the new kinds of capabilities enabled by machines that can see better than we can. In sports, for example, human referees may soon be a thing of the past, in their current roles, that is. Considering the number of mistakes that humans make, it's going to be a matter of time before we have machines assisting human referees in real time with decisions. This is an example of an AI referee crossing the automation frontier through better data and algorithms into the green zone. 
Similarly, cataract surgeons have become automated as machines become really good at this task, better than humans most of the time. In general, this kind of ability of machines to see and read well will enable all kinds of services, new services in areas ranging from healthcare, law, finance, governance, navigation. In navigation, the process will play out as driverless cars get better. Improvements in predictive accuracy from better data and algorithms will shift them to the right. But regulation will play a key role as well in determining how quickly insurance markets emerge in this area. Regulation that is stringent and increases the cost of error will move them up, whereas regulation that limits liability would move them down. We will trust driverless cars with navigation when they cross the automation frontier into the green zone. Which raises the question, where does the shape of the automation frontier come from? It comes from all of us, from our tastes and preferences as a society, and from regulation. If we don't trust the machine with much, the frontier will hug the horizontal axis and make that green zone smaller and smaller. But at some point, we have to confront the trade-offs. For example, if driverless cars reduce deaths by, say, 10,000 a year, which is roughly 25% of all of last year's automobile deaths, but on occasion make mistakes, we will need to agree on the cost of those mistakes in order to reap the larger benefits to society. That choice, those preferences, will be expressed via the shape of the automation frontier. So what does this all mean practically for all of us? More specifically, what does it mean for all the young people and how they should think about and prepare for the future? Let's circle back to the two questions I started with about possible dystopian futures and the future of employment. It's a pretty safe bet to assume that as new capabilities such as AI referees and automated surgeons emerge, they'll continue to move towards the right side of the heat map. Indeed, a goal of data science is the creation of knowledge from data, which shifts problems towards the right side of the heat map and increases our trust in machines. Some professions, such as professors and the police, are still in the red zone because of the real-time spontaneity and judgment that they require, which is still outside the reach of machines at the current time. But in theory, I can imagine being replaced by a robot, or at least most of me being replaced by a robot. Indeed, imagine a future TED Talk given by a robot called Darth Vidar that asks, <laughs> when should we trust humans? <laughs> We're certainly giving machines plenty of data about our behaviors and actions on which they could base their answer. In order to turn the heat map into a practical tool, you need to be able to do some basic calculations, like compare the predictability of problems based on data. You know, where do they lie on the spectrum? Whenever I come across a new problem, I can't help but ask myself, where does it lie roughly on that predictability spectrum? And that's a really useful thing to know. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of you turn into data scientists, although that's a perfectly great profession. Um, but that you understand its basic vocabulary and capability. I tell all my students that in this day and age, computing and data skills are the new math that pervade everything. So all the young people out there, listen up and prepare accordingly. So should we worry about dystopian futures? We certainly should. However, the role of AI systems in our lives will depend on choices we make about when we trust such systems and when we don't. So we should make these choices wisely. Our choices will need to preserve democracy, freedom, privacy, safety, the right to be left alone. Meaning, we should put a high cost of error on situations where these are at risk. The recent exploitation of social media platforms in the last US presidential election was an eye-opening experience about the perils of trusting such platforms as neutral news sources. They are not, and they can be used to our detriment. 
Facebook has promised to alter its objective function to favor more meaningful interaction. But at the end of the day, we should always question the motives and objectives and biases inherent to any commercial platform. What about fears of massive job displacement? History provides a few clues. The field of finance was one of the first to embrace and be impacted by computers and automation. Trading rooms with thousands of people were replaced by machines and people who could work with them in new and creative ways to solve problems. Thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs were eliminated. But technology continues to change the way we pay, the way we borrow, the way we invest, and the way we record ownership. And employment in this industry has actually been creeping up with the exception of the financial crisis. While some of these new jobs are things like technologists, interestingly, the large majority of them are roles like financial managers and auditors. I guess we're not willing to trust machines with signing off on money just yet, or with managing humans. But the important thing to note is that these newer auditors and managers are much more tech savvy than their predecessors. So even as machines do more, they seem to be creating other work for humans, nudging them into new roles that interface with machines or people who work with them. Is this how things will play out in other areas, such as healthcare, law, governance, sports, engineering, entertainment? If I were a betting man, that's a bet I would take. Thank you.